The questions that you must ask yourself when assessing Evan Mobley are, what do you value most in a player? Do you value a player's defensive abilities just as much, if not more, than their offensive abilities? What are the most important and consequential defensive characteristics that a player can have? And do you believe Mobley is just scratching the surface offensively, or is he closer to his ceiling than what would be ideal? What we know about Mobley through his first two NBA seasons is that his defense is way ahead of his offense. He finished third in Defensive Player of the Year voting and was arguably the main reason why the Cavs had the league's best defensive rating. Cleveland's offense sputtered against New York in the first round of the playoffs. They were less physical, they got pushed around, and were out-hustled in every which way. But what shouldn't be ignored is that Mobley's defense was still superb just as it was throughout the regular season. Knicks player shot just 35.3% when he was the closest defender, according to second spectrum tracking data. That's the best mark so far among players who have guarded at least 50 shots this postseason. Let's look at Mobley's season as a whole and evaluate how he did, what went well, and what needs to improve. Let's start with the defense. Mobley contested the second most shots this season per second spectrum. Only Brooke Lopez contested more. And on those shots, opponents shot 44.7%. What's unusual about Mobley though, is that he guards opponents outside the paint as well as any big man we've seen in recent years. You could argue he's the best six foot 10 or above perimeter on ball defender since Kevin Garnett. The combination of his supreme footwork anticipation, instincts, mobility, length, and technique makes him an extremely difficult player to score against in all play type situations. He's extremely good guarding on an island and in space, which is still rare in the NBA for front court players. The only others who are on the same level as Mobley when it comes to guarding in space are Bam Adebayo and Nick Claxton. I did a video on him recently, but I think Onyeka Okongwu, another USC alum, is another one that is really good at this. Here's a look at how well Mobley defends drives. It's hard to find players with his length that have such impeccable anticipation. It's kind of like a goalie in soccer when there's a penalty kick and they have to guess which direction the ball is going to go. Mobley has this knack for sliding in the right direction as his opponent makes his moves toward the basket, making it extremely difficult to elude him off the dribble. He rarely gets fooled by juke moves and all the ancillary movements, generally keeping his opponents in front of him. When he did get beat off the dribble, it was mostly after closeouts when it was clear that the strategy was to force the opponent off the three-point line. Mobley defended the third most isolation shots this season. Only Nick Claxton and Al Horford guarded more. Opponents shot a shade under 41% on those shots per second spectrum which ranked him among the best in this category. What's most glaring about this aspect of his defense is that nearly half of those shot attempts in isolation were against perimeter-oriented players, and those players shot just 38% on those attempts. Here are some more clips to accentuate how well he did in these situations. Clearly his biggest weakness defensively is his lack of strength. Most would agree that in order for him to take his game to the next level, he's going to have to add a lot more muscle and be a much more imposing physical presence. With that said, his one-on-one -on -one post defense wasn't bad. Opponent shot 15 of 37, which is a little over 40%, when they posted Mobley up per second spectrum. While he doesn't necessarily have the best elevation or explosion when contesting shots at the rim, he has outstanding timing when he looks to obstruct and alter shots on the interior when he's serving as a backline or help defender. Especially because he played alongside another very good defensive big in Jared Allen, I don't think this aspect of Mobley's game was highlighted enough, but it's another defensive strength of his. He averaged 1.5 blocks per game, which was tied for ninth in the league. The Cavs ranked third in opponent points in the paint. The Knicks actually ranked number one in this category, 
which was glaring in their playoff series as New York completely sealed off the paint in those five games. Let's now shift over to his offense, and this is where things aren't as glossy, yet at least. The most glamorous part of basketball is putting the ball through the net. We love scoring, and you can't win unless you score more points than the other team. So clearly, the Mobley critics will point to his scoring deficiencies as to why he's not a great player yet. Right now, he's a very poor outside shooter. He only made 21.6% of his 102 three-point attempts. That was tied with Dennis Smith Jr. for the worst three-point percentage among players who took at least 100 threes. From the three-point corner specifically, he shot just 18.6% on 43 attempts. That was 12% lower than in his rookie campaign, although he took 20 fewer of them. Mobley had the worst corner three-point percentage among players this season with at least 40 attempts. Cleveland just didn't have enough floor spacing this season. They ranked 24th in three-point attempts. It's tough to win big these days when your two bigs don't stretch the floor. Mobley attempted the third most post-up shots this season, but like his three-point shooting, he didn't show great touch. He only made 41.5% of his 188 post-up shots, which among players who took at least 100 of them was the worst percentage and it wasn't that close. So many times it seemed he would fade back further from the basket as he went to work on the low block, which caused him to take way too many contested falling away hook shots and push shots. He just seems to be lacking creativity and craftiness down low. He also struggled for the most part scoring on drives. He took 157 shots on drives and made just 43.3% of them. Among all big men who took at least 50 of these shots, that was the worst percentage. And yet despite all these flaws in his offensive game, he still managed to average over 16 points on nearly 55% shooting from the field and 3.8 free throw attempts per contest. So obviously there are certain things he excels at offensively, and at the top of that list is his cutting. This is something Cleveland excelled at all year, as Mobley and Jared Allen led the league with 222 shots on cuts each. And Mobley shot 73.4% on those attempts, which was among the NBA's best marks. He has great hands and great spatial awareness. He also finishes with authority. Probably surprising to many, but he led the league in total dunks made, with 215 of them. He made 525 total shots, so that means 41% of his made shots were dunks. Cleveland played at the league's slowest pace. They were super methodical, disciplined, and deliberate. But I do wonder if Mobley is someone that would thrive in a more fast-paced offense. Now obviously, you don't want to take away from what he and the team do so well defensively. Mobley is pretty good running the floor. He made 70% of his shots in transition, which you can see here in these clips. Another strength of his is his passing. He's just a high IQ basketball player. He makes good decisions. He's very astute. For someone who's not known for his offense, he makes excellent reads in the paint as it relates to kickout passes to the perimeter and also to teammates attacking the basket off cuts. Now he averaged just 2.8 assists this season, but he had 12 games with at least five dimes. Here are a collection of plays that really showcase his excellent vision. So back to the original set of questions you must ask yourself when assessing Mobley. What do you value in a player, and are the critics of him ignoring the uniqueness of what he brings to the table? We must remember that 50% of the game is defense. Scoring is the most glamorous part of basketball, but the reality is, there are way fewer guys who can guard 4-5 to five positions than there are guys who can score over 20 points per game. I pose this question to help create a healthy debate. Do you prefer a player that let's say averages 25 points per game but is a weak all-around defender? Or do you prefer a player that averages let's say 16 points per game and is a top three defender in the league? Now I understand a lot of it hinges on what else the team has on the roster. But it's just hard to get someone who's nearly seven feet tall and defends as well as Mobley does, even if he's just an average or slightly above average offensive player. Don't get me wrong. 
To be a superstar in the NBA, you must score a lot. There are no two ways about it. The tier one guys of the NBA all put up big scoring numbers. But being an elite frontcourt defender is significant too when it comes to where players deserve to be ranked. It's clear that Mobley needs to build his body. If he does that, he'll have a much greater chance of reaching his full potential. The player he resembles, and this was mentioned quite a bit leading up to the 2021 NBA Draft, is Chris Bosh. Now, Bosh had a much smoother, more refined offensive game because he had a very good touch from the mid-range and his face-up game was always on point, especially during his Raptors days. It was with the heat that he extended his range and became a more proficient three-point shooter. Now, Mobley is a much better defender than Bosh was, but I'd say their movements, coordination, and versatility are very similar. I brought him up earlier, but I think defensively, there's some Kevin Garnett in Mobley. Now, KG was a much more ferocious, intense, and energetic player. I don't know if Mobley will ever match Garnett's competitiveness level, but they definitely share some of the same defensive characteristics. So that'll wrap up this video. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe.